All right, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this special presentation of the Sanford Collector Society. I'm Laura Huckabee, the Assistant Director and Collections Manager here, and our guest this evening is John Begno, um, who is the former County Extension Agent Horticulturalist for Tom Green County. He retired in 2008. Correct. So, well, it was not, it was more than just a few years ago. I was going to say a few years ago, but time goes by really fast. Um, anyway, John gave a wonderful presentation on growing things here in San Angelo, past, present, and future, and we hope you've been able to watch that video on our website. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, it's still there. Um, but for now, we're about to do this uh, live question and answer session with John, and some of you have already sent your questions in to us today. Some of you have called with your questions, you've posted them on Facebook, you've emailed your questions, and uh, let me remind you that you can still do that now. You can give us a call at 653-3333 if you have a question for John, um, or you can send it via Twitter, um, via Facebook, Facebook Live, or Instagram. Is that right? Okay, so my techies over here are affirming that all of our social media platforms, uh, will, you can post your questions for John there, um, or again, give us a call at the museum at 653-3333. So, yeah, John, thank you again for uh, doing this alternative format programming with us. We appreciate your flexibility You're welcome, and your Laura. creativity. Well, thank you. Um, he, he did a great TED style talk, um, that, which we recorded and put online. It was available this morning. And um, yeah, I, I'm not very good at growing things, so <laughs> I definitely learned a lot by listening to it. And um, here, I, I guess the maybe the climate and and what we the, the soil, you know, different things that different things about where we live can be challenging even for the most seasoned gardeners. Is that right? They are. You know, if you pick up a gardening book or watch the lawn and garden TV, you get a little spoiled because there are places in the world that are are so easy to garden and. You know, we have challenges as simple as wind in some cases. A good example was last night. Uh, we had some strong winds in many areas, but we have heat, we have excessive cold, we have dry conditions, and there are years we have too much water. So we have those, cha those challenges, but that being said, we've lived through those times, and we've been able to choose plants that have become adapted to those conditions, and we have some really fantastic landscapes considering and so we're able to draw from the dry areas from the windy areas from australia from all around the world we're able to draw and use plant materials and use our own design mechanisms and and have some attractive landscapes that's fantastic so what are some examples of some of those plants that are non-native that are still really well adapted to our climate and, and one thing I did want to talk about, especially when, because if you get to view, you had the opportunity to view the, the presentation, we spent quite a, quite a bit of time on trees because we, we felt that that is an important part. We talked about the heat island effect and the fact that trees are essential to making uh, our landscapes cooler, more energy efficient, water conserving, and so forth. But I never spent the time on telling you what some of the better trees were. And we might address part of the talk where we talked about the 40,000 pecan trees that were, being, that were planted back following the drought of the 50s and made the comment that those might not have been the best adapted, but they were available at the time. Well now, if you and I were looking for trees for our landscape that were, say, better adapted than pecans in that situation, we have what we call the big five or six we start off with live oaks. They're native Texas trees, they're large, they're adapted to good soil, poor soil. The downside to that, Laura, is they're evergreen. And if you were in an ice storm this last winter and you noticed that underneath those evergreen trees it was still icy, whereas in the wide open spaces of under a deciduous tree it was melted. It's very cold in the winter time and very underneath that shady live oak tree. So put it in a wide open space where you have plenty of room. Then we have red oaks that can be an issue. <coughs> Excuse me, red oaks are not as well adapted as they once were. We have a lot of issues with boars on red oaks, so they're not in our big five much longer. We use chinkapin oaks and bur oaks. Bur oaks are very huge. Baptist Memorial Center has quite a few bur oaks and they're very well adapted to some poor soils and also very good soils. 
and then Chinese pistache, which is an introduction from China, of course, but very well, very well adapted. And so we use those in the majority of our large tree land kingdoms. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what about uh, flowering trees or um, larger shrubs? And that's where most of our landscapes fail, is that we choose large trees and we forget about the medium to small trees. And if you're driving around town now, you're noticing red buds blooming, how beautiful they are. You also notice that Texas mountain laurels are blooming, and mm -hmm. they're a tree that gets 15 feet or a oh, large shrub. Those beautiful purple flowers. Oh, and they smell like grapes, and yes, yeah. okay. We have so many of those spring flower islands, wild plums, we have Mexican plums. And as we go into the summer period, we have things like desert willows, which are actually native and very well adapted to our environment. Fantastic. Well, good. Lots of good ideas. Um, again, everyone, welcome to our Facebook Live presentation um, of our Sanford Collector Society program with John Begno, uh, talking about growing things here in the West Texas landscape. And you can call in with your questions, 653-3333, or you can post them on our Facebook page. It will be a Facebook Live, Twitter, Instagram, um, social, social media platforms. Uh, <laughs> they're just one way you can get your questions in. Um, I will also remind you that the session is also being recorded. Um, so if, if you want to tune in again uh, tomorrow once it's available online and watch the whole thing, if you missed some of it, it will be there. All right, um, so here's, here's a question that, um, that we had sent in earlier. Um, how do I tell what kind of soil I have? You mentioned several different types of soil that are in the area. How can we tell what's in our yard? You know, the physical uh, aspects of the soil, how deep it is and how rocky it is, those are easy for you to observe with a shovel, you know. But if you wanted a more in-depth analysis of if there's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that sort of thing, you can send a soil analysis off to Texas a and University. And it, it's priced about $15 to $20, depending upon what you're going to have tested. And it'll come back with an analysis that tells you an awful lot about your soil. In some cases, more than you might know, but it will, or need to know, but it'll tell you if you need fertilizer and what kind of fertilizer that you might need, which is very beneficial in conserving uh, nitrogen and not, uh, let's say, polluting our rivers and waterways by overusing fertilizers. So that's a good way you can pick up those farms either online or you can visit the Tom Green County Extension horticulturist, uh, Allison Watkins, uh, and she can, of course, or the ladies in the office can give you a form that shows you exactly how to take your analysis and where to send it off to. So that's one way, but it, it's usually when we're just selecting plants, the thing that we're most concerned about is how deep the soil is. Because if it's not deep enough, then roots of trees can't anchor themselves, and in a strong storm, they'll lay over, which we saw in the storm of the 90, 1995. A lot of large trees fell over because they weren't rooted well. So how deep it is, if it's shallow, we, we know we have to use a certain kind of tree. If it's deep, we can use almost any kind of tree. And if it's sandy, then we have, you know, that's pretty easy for you and I to tell by feeling it that's going to be one of the most difficult soils to grow anything in. We have very few sandy soils up in the Coke County area and a few other outcroppings, but most of them are clay loam type soil, which is very good at holding moisture. But that's kind of a rundown on your soil. Don't get hung up so much on your soil. You need to know how deep it is, and then you need to know that we have alkali soil. I don't know where you grew up. I grew up in South Louisiana where we had azaleas and okay, camellias and gardenias. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. I'm not going to try it. Not going to happen unless you grow them in a container because those are acid soils. And we have very alkali soil. That being said, there are a whole host of plants that we can grow in alkali soil that will survive and thrive. Uh, there are some that might turn a little bit yellow that we try when we move things from the east to the west, but we add iron and they green up. So you basically need to say, all right, I'm watching Lawn and Garden or I'm reading a book. I'm going to discount acid-loving plants, and then we're going to stay with all those alkali-loving plants. Okay. Okay. Um, so you mentioned 
fertilizer and you know, we don't want to use too much, what about pesticides? What kind of safe pesticides can we use in our gardens? You know, it, that's a very good question. And, and when we say garden, edibles and non-edibles, we'll divide it like that because edibles, it's much more critical because you're going to consume those products, the tomatoes, the, the vegetables, and so you want to use the least harmful product, not only to you, but also to the plants and the environment. So you'll read your label closely, and, and there are products that actually break down in sunlight and in weather in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then you're still going to wash your vegetables. And, and there are a lot of misconceptions about, about pesticides. Uh, they're actually organic pesticides, such as nicotine sulfate, that is more harmful than chemicals that are manufactured to use. Yes, they're more toxic. They have an LD50 that's higher uh, or lower. So, so what you just need to do is a little research on vegetables. You know, a lot of times soapy water, insecticidal soaps, and, and what they do is they actually soften the exoskeleton of most insects and allow them to die. And they're very safe to use in, in landscapes and in guard, vegetable gardens. So do a little research if, you're, if you lean that way. And it's really a philosophy, Laura. If you want to go the organic and non-pesticide way, that's a choice that you can make. That doesn't mean that your vegetables are necessarily safer than the other way if you follow the instructions closely, and that's the key. I grew up in an area where we poured products to spray. We didn't even measure them. We poured them out of a bottle, and the, the adage was a little bit must be good, a lot is a whole lot better. <laughs> and we did that, and, and uh, thank heavens our children and grandchildren don't do that anymore. They read the label closely. And as long as you do that, you'll find out that those products can be very safe to use. We have in America the safest food supply in the world, whether you choose to call it organic, natural, or it's just conventional. It's still the safest food supply and it is tested all along the food chain before it ever gets to you. So even if we don't grow our own vegetables and we buy them at the store, they're still safer than anywhere in the world? Anywhere in the world. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, some good news for once. Thank you. <laughs> you are. Um, so what are some good starter vegetables for young gardeners here to grow? <clears throat> and we see more and more people starting gardens, whether it's in an apartment in, in containers or whether it's ground plowed outside. And, and it, well, the way we like to answer that question is plant what you like to eat. Okay? Broccoli, well, we can grow the hand out of it, but there's a certain percentage of the population which cannot tolerate broccoli, okay. So if, you, if it is tomatoes that you love to eat, then try growing tomatoes. They're staples that we know we can grow. A good example is squash. One zucchini plant can produce 70 pounds of squash. So how many zucchini plants do you need? You better love zucchini if you're gonna have all row of zucchini. You know, that's, that's the old adage was when you go to church, you roll your windows up so someone won't lay a bag of zucchini in the front seat, okay? And, and so we, we can be very successful at those kinds of crops. But if you don't like them, don't roll, okay? So, so that's the way we ease into it. And a good, another good example is okra. You grew up eating okra, I grew up eating okra, but those people a little further north of the Mason-Dixon line didn't and won't, won't plant them and won't eat it. And so, so choose what you like and remember to do everything in moderation. Our growing season starts now in March, April, May, and then you know what July is like. Few gardens survive July. So we quit. We don't try to water and keep them alive. We move into fall gardening in late all of August and early September. Many things like cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, radishes, carrots could be planted in the fall. So we could keep the garden going pretty much all year. There are parts of San Angelo in historical days in North San Angelo where the water was very, very, very good and a lot of it that there were 50 acre truck farms and they had gardens, the Stahas, Mr. Moose, on and on and on. Those people down Colling Lane that was a garden district, and they provided a lot of vegetables locally because they gardened year-round. 
we, we fortunately, we have a farmer's market here. Which we is do. a great resource. Yes, it and is. And sometimes I'm surprised at some of the things that, that I find there. And I think, what? They grew that here? Yes, ma'am. Uh, garlic, a lot of things that you wouldn't think would grow here, but they're very successful. So if you have a keen interest, contact your local extension office, whichever county you're in. They will have a list of vegetable varieties, not just the kind of vegetables, but which varieties perform the best in your area. Great resource to have. So again, if you're just joining us, this is a special presentation of the Sanford Collector Society via Facebook Live. I'm talking with John Begno, and he will tell you anything you want to know about making things grow out here in West Texas. So if you have a question, you can call in during this program between now and 6 o'clock, 653-3333, or post it to one of our social media pages. Do we have anything so far via social media? Not yet. Okay, well we have, we some, have some people watching. We have some that were already yes. posted earlier today. So um, I'll ask another question that came to us via Facebook. Now this is interesting. What are your opinions on decorative topiaries? <laughs> well, uh, we, we categorize gardens as relaxed or formal many times, and topiary comes in a formal garden, just like sheared hedges. And if you've ever got to see or been to or gardens around the world, like the Royal Botanic Gardens, in London at Kew, you, you get the opportunity to see where it's almost centuries of mm -hmm shaping plants and so uh, if you have to uh, you know i love the view them, but i don't want to take care of them okay and that's what you get into is that if you buy one of those things remember that it's going to require maintenance of continually shaping that that plant and i went to the dallas arboretum several years ago for an easter display and they had topiary of alice in wonderland and it was incredible. But it took years to get those plants like that, like that and to use them. So if, if the, there's a whole host of them, bonsai, topiary, uh, all of this, this artwork, I love it, but remember that it's, it's something you live with. So you can't just buy a tree and cut it into the shape that you want? <clears throat> uh, not not normally it, it's going to take more than that now you can buy one that has already started the topiary and, and that's a challenge and it's fun to do uh, you have to put it in the right location be sure you water it correctly fertilize it correctly you have to maintain that plant for it to really continue continue to do what it's training being trained to do so if you have trouble training your dog don't try to train a topiary <coughs> You know, if we look at today's, we talked briefly in this talk about the future of, of landscape, most people are not going to want to spend their Saturday morning out there with the hedge clippers and shearing hedges or, or, or doing that. They want things to look nice. We have moved into the period of a more relaxed look that also requires less maintenance. So the same thing are, 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 is required for topiary and, and that sort of thing. Well, so here's, an, here's another question that came in earlier, um, and actually this is, this is from our director, Howard, and it looks like he brought an example of the offender over here. Oh. The question is, I spent a lot of money on my so I'm sod for my yard, and now there's a patch of clover growing in it. What do I do? Oh, yeah. Well, this, this clover, the chances are he, he got this stuff, or he could have gotten some of this stuff actually with the plant material that he planted. Now, fortunately, what he is showing me, and I don't know, we can't see it too good, but it, it's a member of the mint family, oh. the stem is square. Oh. And, That's and interesting. I have good news for you, Howard. This plant will die on its own if you do nothing. And right now it's in full bloom around the Concho Valley. It's just purple. We, its common name is Henbit. Henbit. And it's an annual. It germinates in the fall of the year. It grows a little bit during the winter, but in late winter, early spring, it just goes crazy. Now, every time you see blooms, that means it's setting seed and you will have it next year, okay? So we don't spray chemicals on that. And we did this presentation and we talked about the first thing you do is identify, is it a pest that you can control? And in this case, you don't need to control it, you need to mow it. 
if you prevent it from producing seeds, that being said, it's going to have seeds next year. Boy, Howard, that's a beautiful yard, let me tell you. You have uh, a lot of hen bit right there. So, so mow the yard short. Trying to catch it is good, to catch the seeds. Know that they will be, will do is come in there and, and use a pre-emergence weed killer. What this is is a granule that prevents this weed from germinating. And so you'll put it down in October, early November, and all of these winter weeds that you see in this picture will not come up, will not germinate, and you won't have an issue with seeds the following year, and they're gone in one year. We do the same thing with summer weeds. And you're putting that summer pre-emergence down right now to control summer weeds. And the yard is, is a nice yard, and what I would like to see Howard do is to go ahead and put a pre-emergence down now for summer and then put it on his calendar in October to do it again and then treat the yard with good fertilizing, good watering, and good mowing. And that's the important three things. Fertilizer, water, and mowing. And mowing frequently is just as important as fertilizer and water. And he will have a weed free yard. Nice bouquet. <laughs> Would you like to keep it? Uh, no, thank you. I have plenty of my own. As a matter of fact, I don't fight it much anymore. The older you get, the less you fight weeds. I'm thinking if it's green, I just leave it alone. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, it's a funny how we have moved to that direction. We talked about history in our talk. In the old days, we were obsessed with weed-free yards. And, and we've gotten to the point with a few weeds now, we can, we can talk about it. And, and that's, I think, a pretty good thing. That's good. Well, good for our um, stress levels and probably the environment and the lawn as well. I think so. That's good. So uh, here's a question um, about container gardening. You mentioned that a couple different times. Oh, um, but before we get to that, we do have a um, question so we have, social media. Yes, so we have a question from Linda on Facebook. I have been encouraging native plants for birds and butterflies, but have had no luck with milkweeds. Any suggestions? Well. And, and unfortunately, with today's situation, we usually have some very well adapted milkweed that are sold by the master gardeners, and their sale is going to be the first Saturday in April, which I think is April 1, right around there. We're not sure they're able to have that. So that you can start with plants that are already, don't start with seeds, start with plants, and there are many milkweeds. There's another thing, if you're really interested in this, and there are native milkweeds called antelope horn that are in nearly every bar ditch in the Contro Valley. And you'll see them showing up in about to six to eight weeks. And yes, it's okay to take a shovel to the bar ditch and dig them up and, and bring them home and, and plant them. That's for the monarch. But there are so many more. There's passion vines for the fritillaries. If you do a little research, there are so many other plants that we can grow that are food source plants. That being said, the number one butterfly plant to feed them, to feed adults, not to grow brood young, is uh, uh, Greg's Blue Mist. And you need to plant it where you can allow it to escape and get away. And it will begin blooming here in about two weeks and bloom all the way till freeze and be solid butterflies all year long when planted in the sun. It's called Greg's Blue Mist. It's a eupatorium. But uh, we have trouble getting hung up on growing milkweed in our landscape, and the native ones like antelope horn, horn are the best ones for us to try. Hope that answered your question. Antelope horn milkweed. Good. So the uh, container gardening question, it sounds like if you're limited to containers, there's still a lot that you can do. Um, so I have a covered patio that's shady in the summer. What kinds of plants grow well in containers that also can tolerate the shade? And you know, we divide them into foliage and, and colorful plants. It's probably more easy to grow foliage plants that have green leaves but not too many flowers in the shade. That being said, if you, the one that might do both is things like a plumbago. Um, they will tolerate shade or full sun. They come in blue and white, and they're very available in every garden center, so it's a really nice container plant. 
Usually the way we approach a container plant is we ask you, you want to plant, this container so big, for instance, that you want a plant that you can put in there that will live through the winter because you're not moving that container. And if that's the case, there are things like Mount Laurels, Yo Palms, there are a lot of green shrubs and things that topiary would be, of course, acceptable in that situation if it was a green plant. But most plants that die down to the ground in that container, that container will not serve its purpose at that location. So if you're moving these, say, inside and you want something that's going to be tropical, the hibiscus do very well. There are plants like the yellow bells, uh, plumbago, but as far as shade goes, plumbago is going to be number one number one plant to grow in a container. Uh, we also like, there's so many other things to do. And for instance, uh, garlic in a container, in the shade, would grow would be just fine. There are plants that you can grow that are also vegetable plants that will tolerate some shade. Or we yeah. have one more online question. Um, she said, we had oleanders that died during the drought. What could we use to take its place that would do well here? Okay, oleanders, uh, if you heard the question, oleanders that died during the drought, and oleanders, Galveston is the city of oleanders. It's because the humidity is so high, you get rainfall, and, and we're at the limit, western and somewhat northern, for oleanders. And they periodically freeze, get a little ratty and so forth. So they're not our number one choice. Many times people will grow them because they grew up with them and they want to use them. But truly, there are not any really drought hardy or cold hardy oleanders. That being said, think about what it is. It's a shrub, a large shrub that flowers. And it flowers nearly all summer long. So you're asking for almost a miracle, if you think about that. And in, in our choices, we have spring flowering shrubs like Indian hawthorn. If you want to see a great example, go look at the front of Tom Green County Courthouse. The walkway is lined with these large Indian hawthorn shrubs that will be magnificent in a few weeks. So, so your, your question about a summer long blooming, we have things like pomegranates that bloom all summer long, but we have nothing to take the place of an oleander if you're wanting like a large screen or a large edge that are going to provide you color all summer long. Unfortunately, that's asking for a little more than we can probably deliver at this time. I did want to talk about something. We, we talk about turf grass and how important it was at cooling our landscape down. Basically, we have three or four types. We think about sun is going to be Bermuda grass or buffalo grass, and they're very tough. Then we go to shade, we're only going to think about something like St. Augustine, or maybe a fescue grass. Those are the choices that we have. You'll see all kinds of, zoysia is kind of one that fits in between. Zoysia grass fits between shade and sunlight, and it's very well adapted. Uh, and they've got some great new varieties like palisades. But you'll see all kinds of examples of, of grass that we cannot grow. Kentucky bluegrass uh, just cannot tolerate our heat. So always look at four hours of sunlight or more. If you have four hours of sunlight or more, you can grow Bermuda grass and you can grow buffalo grass. If you have four hours or less, then you're going to be resigned to either St. Augustine or fescue grass. But we still recommend turf grass in certain areas. If you have a big old dense live oak tree and you've thinned it out, opened it up, getting more sunlight but still or unsuccessful at growing grass, we're going to grow something different any ground covers that we can choose. Okay. Well, we are actually out of time. This has been a very informational and entertaining conversation. I've enjoyed it. Thank I've you. enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you, Laura. John. And um, so there aren't any last questions to cover um, from social media at the moment. So my husband had a question about the easiest grass to grow um, that doesn't have stickers. <laughs> the easiest grass to grow that doesn't have stickers, and believe it or not, all of our turf grasses that we grow specifically don't have stickers. But you were asking for a grass that is thick enough to choke out the stickers, probably as much as anything. And so I asked, have to ask you a question, how much sun do you get? 
And if you say, I have no trees and I have lots of sun, right. all right. Yep. And see, exactly. the easiest thing in the world to grow is Bermuda grass. Bermuda it grass. Takes, it takes traffic from pets. It takes traffic from children. It, if you fertilize it, what are the big three? Fertilizer, water, and mow. If you do those correctly, you seldom have to use a pesticide, and it will choke out stairs. Great. Now, That's that being said, there is one weed. It's the scourge of the Concho Valley. Uh, all of this area of Texas It's called mat chaff flower. And if I describe it to you as a dark green waxy weed on the ground, oh, yes. oh you ever seen it? It has these chaffy stickers all over it, and it's stimulated by mowing, and it is a booger to get rid of. Mm. Uh, then, then we have to have a good thick turf, but we may resort to using a product. And there are several of them out there that will help to control those. But if you'll get a good thick turf grass started, you're number, that's the number one control on that chat flower. Thick turf grass. What if you're allergic to Bermuda grass? You know, and there are um, people that are allergic to, allergic to Bermuda grass. I have a grandson who's that way. Then, then you're going to probably go to zoysia grass. And zoysia is very tough, looks similar, very thin leaf, and palisade zoysia toward the moat. Now, you know, it's hard to say is he allergic to the seed heads of Bermuda grass, because we do have hybrid Bermudas that never make a seed, and, and those are planted from sod, like a golf course green. And they're a little more expensive and a little bit harder to cult culture, but they might be an option, but I'd say easy choice, Tyler Sage Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you. You guys are.